You're about to join Niels Kostrup Larsen on a raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Mark Resimczynski and I, Niels Kastrolarsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global market through the lens of a rules-based investor. For those of you who are regular listeners, this podcast series is all about voicing our differences on the one topic that brings us together, namely systematic investing, using the often overlooked but very robust strategy of trend following. We hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity to learn more by diving into the back catalog and listen to all of the past episodes that you may have missed, like last week's episode with Alan, where we discussed the you know, the very thing about what actually causes trends in the markets, whether it's too late to invest in trend following given the recent run, and its role within risk mitigation buckets at some of the largest pension funds in the US. So if you missed that one, I certainly invite you to go back and listen to this episode. Mark, always great to be back with you and uh, another eventful week. So lots of things to talk about and a very busy month, of course, um, in for anyone involved in the financial markets. How are you doing? How are things where you are? Very good. It's been a long time, or it seems like it, it's only been a <laughs> month, but it seems like a long time. I think the last time we spoke, it was pre-Russia Ukraine war. So uh, I think I've got a few gray hairs since since that time, just reading news and watching markets. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It was uh, prior to um, what's been taking place in Ukraine in the last uh, month or so. So yes, I can't uh, wait to dive into some of the topics that you brought along that uh, I think our audience will enjoy very much. Um, now, let's quickly look at what went down in the markets uh, for a moment. Um, you know, quite a lot to choose from really this week, but perhaps what stood out the most was this vicious bear market in bonds that began last fall. And that continued this week with the two-year Treasury note touching 2.33% Friday afternoon. And uh, let's recall that the two-year note closed last week just below 2%. Now, Fed speakers were again the driver of the sell-off, strongly suggesting a 50 basis point hike in the May 4th um, FOMC meeting and potentially another 50 basis points at the June 15th meeting. Citibank is now forecasting four 50 basis points hikes this year, while Goldman Sachs is expecting that the two-year note will end the year at 2.9%. Those forecasts and retail liquidation of their fixed income holdings is behind this relentless selling. Ironically, equity investors seem to be unfazed by the sharp sell-off in fixed income markets. And since hitting the low for the year in late February, the S&P 500 index has rallied nearly 10%. Now, against the backdrop, the pound sterling and the euro traded sideways for the week as FX traders speculated whether the Bank of England and the European Central Bank will follow the Fed in their inflation-fighting odyssey. The same can't be said for the Japanese denyo. That yen uh, is what I meant to say. That plunged in value versus the dollar. The Bank of Japan has communicated that a weak yen is positive for the Japanese economy and will not dissuade the BOJ head Kuroda from continuing the central bank's emergency monetary policy. This was a fairly light week in terms of economic releases, but the decline in home sales is worth paying attention to. Clearly, the driver of the drop is rising mortgage rates, and the average 30-year mortgage rate climbed to 4.5% this week. And we should be watching that sector closely as it is a significant driver of the overall economy. Also of note was um, Friday's release of the University of Michigan surveys. The forward-looking expected change in prices during the coming year rose to 5.4%, up from 4.9% last month. Perhaps an anecdotal evidence that consumers don't believe the Fed's newly adopted inflation-fighting stance will tame prices. Mark, let me bring you in at this point just to touch on some of the things that may have caught your attention since we last spoke in terms of whatever has been on your radar. Well, there's just so much that's been uh, going on in the the markets. And uh, 
I think that we, we, I know we're going to talk about the Russian Ukraine war and, and that situation. But the one thing that when you started talking about the Fed is, is that, you know, I look fairly closely at the, at their uh, last set of announcements. And, you know, we had the large increase in the dot plots. But more importantly, is, is that to, is to look at the Fed's forecasts that they have. So, so they're forecasting that eh, this year for inflation is going to come in at 4.3%, enough with that transitory inflation. In the next two years, it's going to then go from 2.7 to 2.3%. Uh, now, at the same time that they're expecting that uh, unemployment, for all intents and purposes, for between 2022, 23, and 24, is actually going to stay exactly the sta- same at 3.5%. And growth rate is going to go from 2.75 uh, to 1.9 real growth rate. So, so, so here we have the magic Fed forecast. We're going to have real GDP decline. Unemployment is not going to change at all in the United States. And we're going to raise rates at least seven times this year in 2022. So when you talk about square the circle, how are you going to have this happen where you're going to base? uh, So so what the Fed is actually saying is that we're going to raise rates. We're going to solve the inflation problem. And it's not going to have any impact whatsoever on, you know, for all intents and purposes, GDP and unemployment. So, so there is going to be no pain whatsoever with us taming inflation, which is at odds with you know, just normal thinking. So, so I think that when you talk about what will happen to uh, bonds, what will happen to equities, what will happen to the global economy, a lot of it is based on: Do you believe these forecasts, or? Do you trade against what the Fed is uh, is doing? And and I think that that's what we're seeing because there, uh, with a lot of trading behavior and thinking, because a lot of people said, look, we've seen a lot of trends in uh, bear market trends in bonds. We've seen a lot of moves in commodities. What's the next move? Well, a lot of it has to do with what the forecast of what the Fed thinks and whether they're actually going to follow through on what they what they say they're going to do. Isn't there something called fantasy football in the U.S.? I think we have it over <laughs> this here. This is not fantasy football. No, this is but just... it could be like fantasy Fed policy, right? I mean, it's kind of uh, interesting. But you know, when you when you say all of this, as far as I remember, and um, you probably know this better than I do, I can only think of one period where the Fed really got into rate hikes that didn't break. The whole system, and I think that was back in 1994, where they managed to ra- raise rates, and it didn't completely spoil the party, as we know. So uh, you are absolutely right. I mean, this seems completely um, unattainable in terms of what they say is going to happen and what will really happen. A- another thing that I've just sort of paying attention to a little bit is that when you see these headlines where people have been out saying. You know, yeah, I mean, valuations are fine and the companies are doing great. Um, and, and then you talk about, well, what if rates go to, um, you know, from 1% to 2% as, as they have done in the two year? And people say, oh, no, not a problem. You know, that'll be fine. We're not, uh, that's not going to affect uh, anything. So it's like, it's just like this, you know, it's the same record they play, regardless of what, ha- what actually happens in the markets. They always believe that it. it's going to be fine. Right. So, and, and I think we'll fun, more fundamentally is almost as is that uh, Albert Einstein said he was always fascinated by the power of compounding. And, and we'll sort of say that the uh, mirror image of that is that you should then always be nervous about the power of discounting. Because if you discount cash flows, this is it. So those cash flows are the same. But if you start increasing the rate of interest in which you discount you know, those cash flows, that has an impact on valuation. Is is it that it's a truism? So, uh, and what you really find, and you know, I think we've written about this in the in the past, is there's something called equity duration. You know, so when do the cash flows come in? Okay, and if you know about a bond duration, is a bond duration has more risk because uh, for longer maturity bonds, because the cash flows are are in the more distant future, and so uh, so so it has uh, so any kind of discounting has a bigger impact. 
The same applies to companies. If you have a company where it ha- where you expect there's going to be more growth and you expect in the latter years that there's going to be a much greater impact on cash flows, then any inf- uh, change in the discount rate will have a bigger impact on valuation. Yeah. And you can do the same. I mean, you can, you can do the math and you can look at and find out how high rates have to go before companies and you can actually extra, extrapolate that to to uh, to governments, I guess. But but certainly companies, until they start spending a significant part of their profits on just maintaining financing, of course, right now they are probably financed well in the next couple of years at low rates. But at some point they have to roll that debt. Um, And there's a lot of it. I think we're at the highest level of corporate debt to GDP at the moment in the US. So it just seems to me that um, there could be a lot of uh, headway uh, in front of us. And and that's excluding, of course, what's happening, which we'll talk about later in the global economy. But right. let me just throw in. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. I was going to say that the, uh, the the most astounding comment I heard in the last month about this issue is by Oliver Blanchard, who's the uh, MIT professor. He was, you know, chief economist at the IMF uh, f- for a period of time. And is that and and he probably is the number one economist in the uh, you know sort of post-Keynesian uh, view, uh, in, we'll call it, of the MIT School of Macroeconomics. And and he was just, a, uh, showed up one chart, it was just that he looked at inflation rates versus the real rates, and he looks at the divergence between the two. And we've probably have as large a divergence between those two series as we've ever seen. So when we talk about the magic Fed, the real issue comes down to is, is that you take uh, for short rates, you take the actual inflation and you uh, subtract that off of nominal yields, and we have a negative real rate. So the only way that you get this, re- you know, stable real growth and no change in unemployment is is that real growth rate or real interest rates have to stay negative. And so, so in, in reality, is 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 that we know the Fed has to be behind the curve because we're not seeing those real rates actually change. And then when you put this in the context of, of you know, you remember, uh, and and I sort of we don't talk about this anymore. The Taylor rule, the Taylor Taylor rule, sort of sort of used as a rule of thumb of what should be the uh, appropriate interest rate for for Fed policy and for any central bank. And Taylor rule says that we should have interest rates that should be well above five or six percent. And, and I'm being mo- uh, modest. And all they're looking at is you, you sort of say, how do you close the uh, inflation gap? And then you have, you have to worry about the output gap and you wait the two. But you know, we're way out of line relative to what we would normally think. And, and for all intents and purposes, we still have not had any definitive action on when we're going to have quantitative tightening. So so if you sort of talk about like, oh, are they really serious about solving the inflation problem? Well, they still haven't come to agreement about whether they would actually reduce the balance sheet. So, so they just stopped increasing the balance sheet. We have not stopped. We haven't started actually reducing the balance sheet. And that's even just to say, is there any treasuries that mature that you're just going to sort of say that, well, we're, we're just going to allow that to mature. We're not going to replace it. Right. And at the same time, of course, uh, we know for one, for one thing is for sure, uh, we're going to be spending a lot more money on certain commodities and on defense. Uh, at the same time, so right. um, okay, all right. Well, let's um, let's talk a little bit about what uh, trend followers may have experienced in the last five trading days. I think it's fair to say that um, it's probably been a strong week uh, for the industry. Now, I mentioned earlier that fixed income markets had a pretty bearish week, so I would imagine that uh, most trend followers have done well from those positions. But there was one other market that really stood out, I think, and that was the Japanese yen because that came under heavy pressure this week. And that also should align with short positions um, by most uh, trend followers. And then, of course, we still see energies, grains, metals continue their upwards trends. Um, so that's been another source of uh, profits, I imagine, this week. It's it, One thing that I want to point out uh, is that because – 
there is obviously right now a, a debate about um, of the, kind of the ethical debate about, you know, what about people who are actually making money at a time when there's a war and, and markets are reacting to that. But I just want to make absolutely clear that in terms of trend following and in terms of medium to long term trend following, I'm pretty sure that most of those positions in terms of long energies like crude oil, they're, they're going back all the way to the summer of 2020. That's when these trend following models got long and have stayed long ever since. So these positions have nothing to do uh, with what's going on in terms of the crisis we see in energy markets as a result of Ukraine. Um, and in fact, uh, certainly those uh, managers who have some kind of active uh, volatility control on their positions, they probably would have been selling into these rallies we've seen as volatility increase, so actually providing liquidity. Now, uh, the same goes for other markets that has been in the news, uh, like some of the grains, corn, soybeans, soybean oil. All of those positions have been on for months in, in a long-term trend-following model. So again, we're not... Uh, as an industry, we're not capitalizing in that sense or making bets on what's going to happen in Ukraine um, and how that's affecting on uh, positions. But it is also an, a very good reminder, I think, is that sometimes we have to be incredibly patient with our positions before they start playing, uh, paying out. All right. In terms of trend following or trend barometer, it closed uh, at another strong, uh, really strong level actually yesterday at 75. So continues to confirm um, what I see in the uh, data for trend following performance uh, at a very, very strong level. In terms of volatility, there was a major shift to risk on uh, in sentiment in the last 10 days or so. Um, it started probably last week, uh, continued this week, um, and that is uh, certainly something that um, the uh, S&P built on and will finish the week, I think, up 1.8%. Uh, the VIX, once again, had a rather muted reaction to both the spikes and the declines in the S&P 500 as the uncertainty uh, or the fixed strike volatility declined slightly, but less than expected um, throughout the week. Um, but we did have a pretty wild ride. I think maybe we forgot about that in our notes, um, Mark. But GameStop shares this week, they're back on the agenda. They spiked more than 60% and surged about, about above $150. And um, more important and new, news uh, worthy was uh, not just the price action itself, but also the way it unfolded. A lot of the resurgence can be once again attributed to uh, uh, what happened in January 2021. Speculators are buying these short-dated deep out of the money call options uh, and uh, and that actually squeezes the price up when the underlying dealers uh, end up being short in those um, options and um, i think the highest open interest uh, which is around thirteen thousand contracts at the moment that can be found in a 510 uh, call option uh, and that expires on the 14th of april and that's the highest strike you can get right now <laughs> pretty incredible really and so as market makers hitch a short call position by buying the underlying shares, that pushes the uh, the price and we get this uh, re reinforcing feedback loop uh, as, as, as in the process. What will be interesting is once we get closer to expiry, will people actually start using the S&P um, potentially as some kind of hedge uh, against this? We'll have to wait and see. So anyways... Um, a positive week for trend followers. I think also even volatility managers uh, did pretty well. Mark, we have one question and we have um, quite a lot of great topics um, to discuss. So let's talk about the question from Brett we got in. And um, I think we've touched upon it the last couple of well maybe a couple of weeks ago in in another relationship but i i did want to bring up the question since brett took the time to uh, to write in um and he writes uh, many thanks for time your time invested in producing the show i've been listening for a while this is my first attempt uh, for a question you had commented about rebalancing a portfolio in your latest episode i'm curious if instead of rebalancing based on adjusting the weighting of the portfolio, i.e. the CTA part becoming too large versus a portfolio dedicated to having income from selling option premium. Do you have any thoughts on rebalancing based on the trending performance 
of the various strategies within the portfolio. For example, as a trend following strategy is outperforming other strategies, then stay with it until it starts losing money and then rebalance. Essentially, you would be putting a stop loss on your strategy instead of an asset. There are multiple of strategies from which to choose, and I've often thought about how best to blend them uh, to get the most of the upside with limited downside. So I think what I think what Brett is saying is instead of doing kind of a traditional um, rebalancing where you either want to keep within a certain range of percentage allocation what you wait for is to see once the strategy starts losing momentum it's in its performance, then you do the rebalancing. I've not come across this suggestion before. What are what are your thoughts? Right. Now, now the rebalancing, I put it in a school of thought of this, is that uh, we'll call it uh, craftsman alpha. So, so there's the alpha that you produce from your actual decisions, and then there's alpha that you produce from how you allocate across strategies or allocate across assets. In general, this is that if, let's say, on a ba- basic asset allocation strategy, is that rebalancing on a monthly or quarterly basis adds you know, signif- uh, significant alpha. So, and in reality, what you do when you rebalance is, is that you're you're following a mean reversion strategy. So, uh, because anything that outperforms in a given month, you're going to start to cut back the exposure. If it underperforms, you're going to add back. So, so, so you're a mean reverter by by doing the rebalancing. And generally, the evidence suggests, in a long periods of research, that that's a really good thing. Now, when you turn that to strategies, you have to sort of say, well, what does that do if you sort of uh, have a trend-following strategy? I get a little bit different within that strategy because uh, you sort of say, okay, if rebalancing is mean reversion and I'm a trend follower, then as my trends start to do better for my weights inside my portfolio, I'll have increased exposure. And what you're going to be doing is taking that exposure off at the time that it's actually performing well. So you have to realize is that what you're doing is you're counteracting to some degree the very strategy that you have. If you have a portfolio of different strategies and then you rebalance on a monthly basis and trend following has done very well, and so let's say trend following has done very well uh, for the first two months of this year relative to many other strategy, you would have actually been reducing your exposure to trend following and you would have reduced your trend following exposure at the end of February. And, and then, you know, if Mar- March continues to show to be good performance, you would have had underrepresentation because you're rebalanced. Similarly, if at the end of this month, if, if let's say we have another good month for trend following, if you're a rebalancer, you're going to start taking money away from that. So uh, so what, what have people done to sort of offset this? One is, is is that you don't rebalance as, uh, on a regular basis. Monthly, you do it you know less frequently on a quarterly basis. That's one. Second, you d- only do rebalancing based on performance, not on time. The results from doing that type of work is a little mixed because uh, you say, well, what is the right level that you should uh, sort of rebalance at? Should it be a, a, a divergence of X percent versus your average performance? Now, if you've had poor trend following performance for a while, and then we have had a good quarter for, let's say, if we come in with a good quarter, then you would actually would sort of say, oh, look, I'm going to have to cut back my exposure again when trend following d- does best. So I would say it's not an easy question you have to realize that what you're actually doing is philosophically the opposite of what goes on for trend following. And you have to sort of say, can you be comfortable taking the opposite position of what the underlying strategy is trying to do? Yeah, I I don't know if I heard your answer exactly how Brett asked the question. I heard his question as, you know, should you allow the trend followers to let their profits run? So you kind of trend follow your trend follower. And maybe that was what you alluded to as well, Mark. But if you trend follow your trend follower, you kind of wait for the maximum performance. And then once you start having a correction, you then make your rebalance, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think that really works because if you're having a portfolio, and trend following is only one of your strategies, 
you can't look at it in isolation because what yeah. if the other strategies were doing great at the same time or vice versa? So I'm not a big believer in having too many fancy rules, just like within the trend following. I don't think we need to overcomplicate and we shouldn't strive for perfection because what works over time and what has worked for decades in trend following is not shooting for perfection, in my opinion. So I'm when I hear these different suggestions on on rebalancing i like the suggestions that goes in something like well i have a range so my my trend following allocation can be between 20 and 30 percent for example but if it gets to 30 okay i have to cut back i don't want it to go above 30 percent on the other hand it's okay if it drops to 20 because performance is is bad etc etc it's part of the course so again you're just giving it a little bit of breathing space um that's because we know, actually, we can see that. I actually brought some data we can talk about later on in terms of how much the quote-unquote optimal allocation to trend following can change uh, over time. Because it, it just looks at the the point in time when you do the calculation um, and also how you define optimal, of course. So I um, I guess to my point of view, uh, Brett, was just be, just make something simple, but that gives all the, your strategies, a little bit of breathing space. And one thing I want to finish off with, and maybe we're going to come to that um, also later, people, it's tempting, frankly. It's tempting after such a great run in performance of trend following to start saying, well, maybe I should cut back on my trend following, right? But if you think about it, some of these trends have been good for quite a while now. I mean, this is the fourth year in a row where trend following is putting on an index level in a uh, positive performance. So you can't, you have no idea in reality how long this can go on for. Um, and therefore, you need to let the managers do their job because what happens for most, for a lot of managers, like obviously there are people who will do it differently. But for a lot of managers, when you have an increase in volatility or you have an increase in risk levels, et cetera, et cetera, um, they will cut back uh, some of their commitment to uh, to some of these positions. So they are not running the same level of of uh, contracts uh, as they did when when the trends and and the markets were very calm. So I think I'm very very strong advocate for the fact that you need to leave the trend following part as a core allocation in your portfolio. You need to be need to leave it as a constant allocation with a bit of breathing room, of, as as mentioned. And then you just need to uh, sit back and relax um, for for a couple of decades, frankly, mm -hmm. because these strategies, um, you just never know when they're going to work. Uh, we all remember November last year. November last year finished on a really, really sour point uh, with a massive reversal in markets, oil dropping 12% in the last day over Thanksgiving. And trend followers had a rough November, frankly. If people had, if you had asked someone at that point, what do you think the next four months are going to look like? I don't think anyone would have guessed what happened next. And that's the reason why you shouldn't fiddle with your, tr it's one of those strategies, in my opinion, where you just don't fiddle with it. Right. And, and I think the, uh, the idea of always having ranges for asset allocation is is probably the best representation of how you should uh, deal with this. So you, uh, if you don't have any view whatsoever, you do this on a time on a time basis. If you have some kind of view, is is that having a range is is probably the best approach. Now I will turn to uh, the question around. Is that everybody always asks the question? Is that should I cut back my trend following exposure when performance has been very good? The next question you should ask. Will you add to trend following exposure when it's really bad? No, so that's when they get... cut it. That's when they cut it as well. Exactly. It's... So, so, so let me put this. Part of the rebalancing question is always the question is: is that do you want to sell your winners and and buy your? Uh, but at the same time, is is that can you be able to buy your losers? So, so what happens is is that that everybody sort of said like, oh. Trend following has done really well. I better cut back my exposure. At the same time, when trend following doesn't do as well relative to other strategy, then they're sort of say like, "Well, I'm not going to add to it now." <laughs> when when at the same, so if you follow a rebalancing approach, and it's a, and it's a, you're let's say you're using a range approach. Well, 
if you're going to cut back your exposure when perform and you're at the top of the range, then you have to add exposure when you're at the bottom of the range. Yeah, just to jump a little bit in it, but actually uh, I recorded a really great episode um, uh, on the Allocator series this week. I mean, I recorded, meaning I was there, but it's really Alan, of course, who is doing the the moderation. Um, and um, and we did uh, a recording that's going to come out in a, in a few weeks uh, um, with uh, Hugo Chapel Cure from uh, Rothschilds. Super fascinating, smart guy, one of the smartest people I've met in this industry. And um, and 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 and. He he, you know, I don't want to spoil the uh, the punchline, but he, let's put it this way, he had a fascinating story about how they forced themselves to do certain things that they had agreed to do because they know exactly that it is so difficult to do when it happens. Like you said, how many people do we really know who buys trend followers when they're in a drawdown? Not many. And that's despite five decades of evidence that the best time to buy a trend follow is when they're in a drawdown, right? So it's um, it's an interesting thing. But anyway, let's move on to your topics because um, we um, they are very interesting. So thanks for your question, Brett. I hope this was helpful. Um, now, your first topic is something that I'm thinking, hmm, has Mark been listening to the last couple of podcasts? Because I've kind of alluded to the fact that in the last month or so, I have for the first time maybe really formulated a thesis in my own head as to because i have been asked this question so many times and and even though i don't like the phrase of it um uh, is you know why has trend following been performing um below par in the last decade or so and i don't necessarily agree with that but i do agree that if you look at the, say, the SOCGEN CTA index, there was a five-year period of no performance, flat performance. So if that's what we're talking about, okay, that's perfectly fine. But anyways, so I've been formulating in my own mind as to how do I answer this question in a better way. And uh, I've started to connect the dots from people who uh, have been on the podcast, stuff that I've read. Um, And so when you wrote this first topic where you said globalization, the dark ages, what does that mean for trend following? I'm super curious to hear your thoughts to see if if they are in line with my own. So uh, take it away, Mark. Right. Well, let's first talk about what we mean by the dark ages. This is that we've had, we're at a global inflection point that where the world is changing and usually when you have these inflection points, some people see them. A lot of people sort of say, yeah, you know, they, they, they sort of feel it, but they don't really sort of internalize the fact that the world is changing. And I'll go back to uh, Keynes wrote on the uh, economic consequences of peace. He said this is pre-World War I, that he could sit in his living room in London and he could pick up the phone and he can call for coffee from uh, from Africa. He could call for, you know, copper in uh, in from Chile, you know, that, that you're, the world was at your fingertips. And that was sort of the golden age of globalization. Then World War I came. And if you look at world trade, this is it. And you look at the, uh, the, the long t- trend uh, growth rate in, in uh, trade, this is that it was stacked in and uh, it, it, it was positive, but we didn't get back to the same trend as we had pre-World War I. Then we had the Great Depression. Then we had a great increase in trade you know, as we uh, sort of uh, re, uh, redeveloped the world uh, post-World War II. But it, to get us back to the same trend line, it, it took us to like 1975. Okay. So what do we have here? We have sanctions that are causing, uh, you know, logistical problems. So we're we're actually, you know, sort of, you know, disconnecting ourselves financially from the rest of the world. Meaning, we'll call it the liberal order versus the rest of the world. We're doing this also with with trade. We're putting in. Uh, trade restrictions. Uh, so we'll say Ukraine is actually restricting the export of grains. And so we're decoupling ourselves from the rest of the world. Now, this didn't just happen in the last month. This is that we started to use trade restrictions, tariffs over the last couple of years to punish those that we uh, we don't like or punish those that are outside the regular, uh, you know, normal liberal order community. 
And so what you're seeing is, is, is that what happens when you start to disconnect the world is, is, is that, well, you disconnect capacity, economic capacity, and you, and you disconnect the ability to arbitrage differences around the world. So what you see is you have a problem is, is, is that there can be greater divergences across markets because we are a more disconnected world or we're becoming a more disconnected world. At the extreme, I, I use the uh, analogy is, is that there is a Kurt Vonnegut novel ca called Cat's Cradle. And there was a certain element that they had in the, in the story. It was called Ice Nine. And it was a, a polymorph form of water that it, at normal room temperatures, it was turned into ice. And so anything it touched that uh, was at room temperature also turned into ice. So once you start getting sanctions and, and you start putting in restrictions, it could cause gridlock around the rest of the world. So, so, let's, uh, so that sort of sets the, the uh, environment that we see right now. And you know, it's possible that you can see a dark age for, for globalization. So if you're a trend follower, you say, well, who cares? Okay, that's, that's big geopolitical issues. How does that impact myself as a trend follower. Let's take our basic philosophy of how we view trend following, or at least uh, I view, and I think others would probably agree, is that I always think of it as a divergent strategy versus a convergent strategy. So when you have large divergences in the world, then you're going to have more trends. You're going to have bigger movements in prices, and because of those bigger movements in prices, there's a greater chance for exploitation. So why do you have these big movements in prices? It's because especially uh, in commodities markets, because uh, we'll take that as the simplest and best example, is that demand and supply is highly inelastic. It can't adjust in the short run when there is a shock to the system. So a uh, perfect example for, uh, for wheat prices. Winter wheat was actually planted last year. So it's planted uh, in the fall and then it goes dormant and then you, and then you uh, harvest it uh, in, in the springtime. So if let's say we don't get winter wheat or wheat coming out of Ukraine and Russia, this is that you can't just sort of say, well, we're going to turn, we're going to put on a third shift. We're going to add some more winter wheat. It's done with the, 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 Northern Hemisphere winter wheat crop is done for, for the year. It is whatever it is going to be. So in the short run, it can't adjust. Okay, Can people then adjust their, uh, their caloric intake of wheat? No, nope, that's probably, uh, you know, you can't, you got to look for some sub substitutes and that doesn't happen in the short run or you're going to have to try to find different ways to get your, your calories. So, in a short run, you have inelastic demand, which means is that you could have larger movements in price. Well, in the medium term, well, what about that? This is that we still have a certain, you might be a little bit more elastic. So because as uh, they did in the 1970s, they said uh, Earl Butts was the uh, Secretary of Agriculture when we had the great uh, wheat robbery in the early 70s. He said, well, American farmers could, uh, you know, plant fence post to fence post. He said, well, we can uh, add some more acreage, but then the problem comes in is, is that, well, you're going to need fertilizer. And if you looked at fertilizer prices, they're up s significantly for, uh, you know, uh, phosphates, nitrogen, potash, all of them are all, you know, have, have reached all-time highs. And so the last all-time high was in the last super cycle. So, so you, you sort of say like, well, even if we can put more uh, grain, uh, we plant more grain, if we don't have fertilizer, we can't get the same kind of yields. We get uh, about 15% of, uh, of fertilizer, uh, 10 to 15% uh, is imported from the uh, United States. If you look at Brazil, it's almost all imported from other countries. So we're one of the big fertilizer exporters, Belarus. Uh, so, so you here uh, have a situation is, is that where, where are you going to get fertilizer to, to actually pl plant and make up the shortfall? And then in the long run, you'd sort of say like, well, what's going to happen in that case? Well, you need to have more capital investment. And we could talk about that for energy. But, you know, if that capital investment uh, 
Well, because of ESG, we want to have less investment in, in energy companies, fossil fuel companies. And, you know, a shale oil field is not like a faucet. You can't just turn it on or turn it off. So uh, you look at the idea that uh, we said that we're now going to sell more LNG, the United States, to to Europe. This is it. Well, well, how the heck are you going to get it to Europe if there's no new LNG tankers available, and those have already been contracted out at very high prices because it's already going to, you know, Japan and other other locations. So you could say, like, we're going to promise you more LNG. Is this it? Well, how are you actually going to get it there? Uh, you need the easiest way to do it, and the most efficient way is is to have uh, have pipelines, and so we restrict pipelines. So what we see is is that. When you deglobalize, you put on sanctions, you have these shocks. And so you can have greater divergences in commodity markets. You look at stock market indices, is, is that if we have financial uh, sh shocks, we have probably uh, the impact in Europe is going to be different than the United States. So stock market correlations are going to change. You look at bonds, well, you look at, uh, you know, uh, bonds are going to be very sensitive to financial conditions. Financial conditions, and you look across the globe, have been changing because capital is not going to be able to flow in some countries as quickly. So because of that, we should see greater dislocations in bond markets. And so uh, so what we're going to see, uh, currency markets are going to be greater uh, dislocations for the simple reason is, is, is that monetary policies are going to be different. So if we go by each asset class, if we deglobalize or we put on different sanctions, then you're, uh, and if there are different restrictions on trade, and it could also be tariffs, it could be very, very nationalistic policy if you sort of said like, well, if I know there are going to be potential shortages, should I trade away some of my resources to other countries or should I keep it at home? Uh, or even the countries that say, I think I'm going to have more manufacturing at home as opposed to get it from other sources because I may not be able to get it from those other sources in a different world order. Perfect example is, is computer chips. This is that, you know, a lot of computer chips come from, you know, Taiwan and come from other parts of the world. This is that I think every country is now going to think about how do I get my computer chips manufactured inside my borders? Because that's what I can, can control. And then finally, without making any judgments about sanctions or uh, other issues, this is that if you can shut down SWIFT, if you can put on sanctions, if you can restrict uh, you know, uh, capital from moving around the world, and then you say, well, what does that tell me about my investments I should make in other parts of the world? This is that if you look at uh, companies that invested in Russia, uh, even before sanctions because of reputational risk, they said, I'm, I'm going to get out of Russia. Make, make perfect sense, but at the same time is, is that if, let's say, we lifted the sanctions, if, let's say, the war stopped and we went back to the old ways and we said we're going to lift the sanctions, if you're a company, would you want to invest in some of these countries or would you put all your investments back in those countries? Is that, you know, reputation and, uh, you know, adjusts slowly over time regardless of government policies. So, what does that mean for markets is, is that across the board is, is that we should see higher volatility. Across the board, we should see more dislocations. Across the board, we're going to see lower correlation across markets. Across the board, we should sort of see the likelihood that inelastic demand and supply will lead to greater uh, changes in price. And I think that the that leads to what are the strategies that are going to best take advantage of that. And so the question comes in, is it mean reversion? So that you're going to say that prices are going to move back to what they were in the past? Or is it more likely divergence is that we're going to move to new equilibrium prices? Yeah, 
No, I completely agree. And it's not your thesis uh, or your, uh, your what you just said is, is vastly different from mine. But I think we're going to leave it at that because there's no point in me saying more or less the same thing. People are going to be bored by that. Um, but I completely agree. And I think it's much more severe. Uh, I guess uh, that's how I would leave it. It's much more severe. I think that anyone can comprehend what these changes will mean uh, in the world for the for for financial markets. And if there's one thing I just want to add to that, and I think I mentioned this before, is that I do think that we have, given what's taken place the last twenty years with kind of central bank policy, et cetera, et cetera. I think we have, uh, for all intents and purposes, lost the imagination of what can happen. We're kind of used to this conditioning of, yeah, it'll be relatively uh, benign because the Federal Reserve and other central banks will be there. Uh, I will, though, suggest that um, if people haven't uh, already listened to it, I did release on Wednesday uh, a conversation with Kevin Coldiron, who is one of the authors of a book called The Rise of Carrie. Um, and that actually is part of my thesis as to why the last two decades have been more challenging maybe for trend falls compared to the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. But I'll leave that at, at, at that for now. Well, um, you know, I think the, yeah. the final point on this is, is that, uh, that, you know, when we've talked a little bit about geopolitics, and, and yeah. that's probably better for radio com- conversations or podcast conversations. But think of this in terms of arbitrage, because uh, and one of the problems for tr- uh, trend followers to some degree, and I'm, I'm making generalizations, <laughs> they hate arbitrage because, in some sense, arbitrage actually sort of forces prices back to you know, equilibrium, they mean revert. If let's say that interest rates in one country becomes really high, then capital should move and, and sort of then it should force interest rates back down to the, uh, to the, you know, global norm. If let's say that there's, uh, a, uh, problem of a harvest in North America, well, the quote unquote in the long term arbitrage is this, that South America will plant more crops in the South, uh, Southern hemisphere. And so what happens is that, that the dislocation will be limited because there that somewhere around the globe there is excess capacity. Somewhere around the globe there is a potential for arbitrage where if prices get out of line, that they, they can be pushed back by production somewhere else. This is that if let's say that there is more friction in trade and friction in investment then this this global arbitrage across markets cannot occur and consequently there's more room for trend following to to be successful absolutely completely agree with that you also had another point you wanted to uh, discuss uh, something that uh, of course has been on many uh, cta's um, mind and agenda and that's uh, our dear friends at the lme and what happened there and obviously you'd love to hear what your thoughts are on on that well this this is actually sort of you know if you remember there's been a trend to say like well we want to have centralized clearing and uh because we love this we want to have everything you know forced onto exchange ill trading to go on exchanges you know i think that in some sense that's good but the exchange model is different than a, you know, an over-the-counter model or a bank lending model. And one is, is that I always sort of use the idea is, is, is that uh, the hallmark of a good futures exchange, losers pay and no credit. <laughs> so so this is what uh, what happens. If you're a loser on, on a trade, is is that you know at the end of the day, when you have a margin call, you got to pay up. <laughs> so and the second thing is that Sorry, you know, we're not extending you as an exchange or as a as a system. We're not extending you any credit. So so you you got to pay up with with cash. And the reason why the system works is because those are the two things that ha- happen at the end of every day. Okay. Now what happened at the LME is is that the losers did not have to pay because we sort of you know, sort of stop trading, and then we sort of uh, you know canceled contracts. And in some sense, uh, the process behind that was is that uh, 
by the exchange closing down the nickel contract, they are allowing losers to find other credit sources to make their payment. So they were, in some sense, extending credit. So, uh, so, so they broke the fundamental model of how we view futures trading. So you say, like, well, why does this uh, happen? This is that, well, you got to remember, they didn't have price limits. And so one of the, one of the keys to making a good system, now, uh, everyone sort of, uh, sort of, you know, they might have different uh, views on this, but if you're going to have, uh, you know, variation margin and daily mark to market, is, is that, it, that if there are the potential for fat tail events, and either side or extraordinary events, then you may want to have a timeout period with pr uh, price limits, daily price limits. And so the whole idea behind that would be to sort of say like, well, that'll give us a timeout and allow for people to actually gather the credit or gather the cash they need to make their margin payments. So uh, there used to not be any price limits uh, pre the 87 crash on stock index futures. And then they uh, put in circuit breakers in, in the system. In some sense, this is that I sort of uh, joke. It says, uh, let's take a time out. Let's sort of allow people to reassess the market and then we'll allow it to reopen even if you have circuit breakers intraday. So now, after they take the time out, they might still think that the market should go down, <laughs> but it gives people a period of time to say, let's, let's take a time out and think about what, what's, what's going on here. So you didn't have that. Uh, you probably should have been increasing margins along the way because, you know, nickel prices were going up and whatever they were doing, they should have done more of it. The final issue is, is, is that uh, because it's a, you know, more of a deliverable contract, is is that then it's all more the important on what the exchange does to look at and monitor the sizes of positions, and so the sizes of positions were well out of line relative to you know what uh, what was normal and what was in the warehouses. So if you have large short positions that exceed the amount of uh, nickel that's in warehouses, well then you have the potential for short squeezes. That doesn't mean it's going to occur, but the probability actually goes up. And so then you could have a situation is, is that if people determine or figure out that uh, that one side is a large positions and it, they uh, there's not enough deliverable supply, well, then all you do is you just hang on to your positions. And when, when they want to sell them back, you won't allow it. You, you won't sell them back at the price that they would like to. So, uh, so, so monitoring is important, uh, and monitoring not only in the future side, but on the OTC side. So you have to see both sides uh, of, of the market. Uh, and then finally, we sort of say that this is a classic problem of, we'll call it the hedger dilemma. And the hedger dilemma is, is that if you're a miner, uh, I'll take that, uh, as a, or even if you're an energy company, and if you're long the physical commodity, but you're short the futures. The short the futures because it's marked to market, you have to be able to put up cash. And so uh, you could have nickel in a mine, but if you have a margin payment on the loser pays no credit, then you have to have cash to be able to finance that. And if you can't get to financing on that side to do your hedging, is that there is a potential if the market price goes up, your underlying nickel in your mine has also gone up, but that's not a liquid investment. So, so we'll sort of say that the all the nickel that was held by some of the large Chinese, you know, uh, miners, or fabricators, this is that uh, their balance sheet looks a lot better. But at the same time, this is that on your hedges you have to put up the the cash. So. What and now what this means is is that and I think that this there's an argument to be made here is is that how does that change your behavior if you're a market participant if you know that they the rules of the game can change if the rules of the game can change then that means that it adds a level of uncertainty and contracting and what do you do under those situations. And and I think that that's that's sort of scary. And I'm I'm not saying that to say this is related, 
But if you look at open interest at the LME, you look at open interest in a lot of futures contracts, it's been falling. Open interest is, uh, so here we have sort of one of the greatest trend environments ever. We have high volatility and people are not actually trading. The open interest of holding positions is actually in a decline. And we'll probably sort of say that uh, we're having, uh, we talked about divergence. Divergences can come to uh, come to a point of disruption and disruption uh, is not good for trend followers and not good for markets. So we said we like divergences, but at some point that there can be a zone where there becomes disruptions. So the LME is a disruption. We're seeing is that for a lot of the uh, energy traders, especially in Europe, uh, you know, so that trade finance has been very difficult. Is, is that getting the cash to be able to uh, to do their uh, brokerage business and their intermediation is not available. You know, a cargo uh, of of uh, you know energy or let's say natural gas or oil. That same cargo that you moved a year ago is probably costing you more uh, or double in the amount of financing. So financing is not so that causes gridlock. Uh, you know the f- high disruption. If let's say we can't get grain to a lot of the importers of Russian and Ukraine grain, which is that we could have food riots. A perfect example is the last time we had a big you know grain spike was in uh, you know. 2011, 2012, is that they talk about the Arab Spring. Well, part of it was uh, was the fact is is that food prices were going through the roof and and the governments couldn't subsidize it to the same degree. So, uh, and even from a geopolitical and high disruption, this is is that there's an interesting article that was reading about uh, Chinese farmers. And they said, if we can't get fertilizer, we're not going to be able to to grow the crops we want. And we don't know if we could feed the 1.4 billion people in China. So if I was China, I said, said in some senses, in a geopolitical sense, well, they have to straddle the middle, a uh, middle ground because in some sense, where do they get all a lot of their fertilizer? It's from Belarus and Russia. So, uh, so divergence are good, but when it moves into the area of disruption, then you have larger problems where the structure of the underlying markets start to break. And like in the LME, we'll sort of say this is that what happens if you can't believe in the contract and the value of contracts or the sanctity of contracts from the exchange? So then you may not trade. Yeah, no, I think that certainly the LME uh, issue has raised a lot of issues. And I would not be surprised if um, managers uh, would stop trading some of these contracts. Certainly, that's definitely something we have on the agenda on our side and um so i guess to answer your your point i'm not so surprised that open interest on the lme is going down i think people are voting with their feet uh, to some extent on that one but uh, open interest in other markets i think to some degree uh, is also just a function of increased volatility and therefore for every anyone who uses some kind of volatility adjustment uh, or risk adjustment in their portfolio they simply have to have fewer contracts on in order to have the same risk on uh, with increased volatility so i think that's part of what we see in those places uh, as well to that point and i had a conversation with someone from a large brokerage firm and says that and i have not verified now i want to look at the data over this weekend is that sort of CTAs as a percentage of open interest is probably the highest that they've ever seen in history. So so CTAs, uh, so you expect this is that, well, some CTAs hold their position, others sort of vol adjust. This is that now they've been vol adjusting, but we'll say the rest of the market has exited. So we'll sort of say the importance of CTAs relative to all other types of traders in the market may be more important than what it has been in the past. Now, now I have to verify that, but I would sort of say it's an interesting, uh, you know, hypothesis that a person says. So he said, like, that's going to have a, other impacts on markets when you have one group that, that's more dominant than others. So that's something that's actually going to be, uh, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'll say on my research agenda for the near term. 
Yeah, no, I'd be very uh, interested in in hearing those uh, results. Um, maybe the other investors just got out too too early, as as we often talk about. You know, CTAs are the dumb ones, right? Because we keep riding these trends, and so maybe maybe we're the ones uh, that are actually still in these trends, <laughs> and uh, and everyone else is is getting out. Anyways, we've already uh, been talking for an hour, so I want to um, uh, just maybe pick one or two of these um, topics that you, because you have always, you bring so much valuable information. So um, I um, I would let you pick one or two of the remaining ones that you find most interesting. I think number eight um, is pretty interesting. Um, when it comes to bonds, but I'm not going to uh, right. to influence you too much. But anyways, what what would you like to finish off with today? You know, the one that I want to talk to you is sort of timely. Is, is okay. that, and we were mentioned at the at the at the beginning of our call is is that uh, Ned Johnson uh, from Fidelity, who was the driving force between F- Fidelity Investments, uh, you know, died this week. So he's about 92. So and uh, so I worked at Fidelity in the you know, early, uh, well, mid nineties is the head of uh, fixed income, you know, research. Uh, and so I had a chance to work with him at, at, uh, at, uh, and, and have some, uh, dealings with him on a, a pers- uh, personal level. And I will say he was a tough manager. He say he was, uh, he was not an easy person to work for is, is this it, uh, you know, uh, all uh, obituaries are laudatory, but at the same time, is that you you have to be very prepared for uh, for any meeting with him. And if you are not prepared, is is that uh, you have you you are scarred coming out of the coming out of his office. Uh, that said, is is that the one thing that influenced me was some of his philosophy, and his philosophy that he uses was uh, the Japanese uh, philosophy of kaizen, which is incremental improvements to reach to perfection. And I think that this is, he always sort of said, let's, let's try to always try to say, how can we get a little bit better? And we could do it as a group a little bit better every day, every month. And so that's what we're going to try to do is, is it, and so we're going to, and I want to say inch our way forward, but we're always going to look for this incremental improvement. And that, that probably really stuck uh, to me. And I'll po- pose this as a question for f- for further podcasts, but we'll sort of say for trend followers, there's almost like two approaches to uh, to how you build models and look at models. One is is that I'm going to build the best model possible, and then I'm going to just stick with it, and I'm not changing. And that has worked for a lot of people. Okay. The other approach, and I sort of say, and something that I sort of. And I used to say as I was influenced prior to this, but I guess is that Ned Johnson is is that if there was a lasting impact from him as a person on on me from working at Fidelity was this idea of Kaizen. So I look for incremental improvement, which means is is that if I have a model, I'm always trying to say, is there things on the margin if my portfolio get I could do to make it better? And uh when I have researchers, and I was actually having this research a conversation with a researcher actually just the other week, he was saying like, "Oh, the task we got to do here is so difficult. I don't know if I could do it." And I said, "Look, what we do is we start out simple. We start out with a simple model, and then we'll add complexities, and we add the level of complexity until on margin it doesn't give any more improvement, and then we'll stop. But so we always have something that we think works." And then we'll sort of say, we're going to add, sort of say, let's see if we can add some bells and whistles. If it incrementally improves to what we want, then we continue to keep it. If we not, we we take a step back and we'll go back to simple. Or, or And then we say, what is the cost of that added complexity if it seems like it's really high and it seems like we're sort of, you know, fitting the data or overfitting the data, then we'll take a step back and we'll move back to the simple model. And, and so I think that this is always with, you know, philosophies on how you build models is that do you build it once and then just run with it and sort of say, I accept, you know, the pros and cons with that model, or do I engage in incremental improvement? And so as I sort of think over Ned Johnson, I read some of the obituaries and I sort of, you know, think through 
my time with him and sort of say, how does different people influence you? I'd sort of say that Kaizen has influenced how I think. And it's something that everyone who's on this podcast should at least consider how you want to uh, approach incremental improvements or a theory of Kaizen. Well, we know Jerry said last time he was on that he stopped doing research, so we know what camp he's in. If I look <laughs> at uh, if I look at the firm that I work for, I would say we've been in both. We probably started out um, by not making any changes for a couple of decades and and kind of stuck with what we had in terms of philosophy. And then when when uh, you know after the year two thousand, I think we went uh, all Kaizen, frankly, with these small incremental improvements, not often but small and incremental um so uh, but it's a very very good question um i imagine that john henry was in the first camp meaning not making too many improvements uh, yeah but i'm guessing and, and i i will sort of say that uh uh you know ned johnson was a, a was a uh, was a tough boss and so it, it prepared me well for working with john henry uh <laughs> and and we we will sort of say is this is that he was definitely in the camp of you know sort of we we sort of build the model and we stick with it and then i sort of say had the view of this is that well i was a you know proponent of kaizen how do we sort of incrementally improve how do we sort of constantly t talk about this uh, incremental improvement to get to some per, uh perfection and so that did cause tension I'd like to believe that that led to a better process overall. Uh, but at some point, is this is that you could sort of see is is that if you have two different views, that 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 can cause uh, you know sort of uh, philosophical conflict. But then out of conflict, you're going to get your best thinking. And I, I'd like to think sure. that by constantly pushing incremental uh, improvement, then then it causes the other party to say, okay, well, why am I sticking to what I have? you know, why is what I have and, and not changing a, a better proposition. And and I think that if I was working with, with Jerry, for example, is this is that I know that he comes from a different camp. And if I was sort of say like, I would probably constantly be pushing this at Jerry, how can we look at incremental improvement? And he'd say, Mark, would you stop that? We got to stick, we got to stick with the philosophy is, is that I don't, I don't want to hear what you're change, uh, what these constant ideas of change. That being said, is is that you know a Kaizen incremental improvement view doesn't say, oh, I've got to change when things go bad. Kaizen would say, say you got to also uh, you know think of improvement even when things are going well. Well, if you think about it, I have two th thoughts that I wanted to share. Uh, if you think about it, I think of Jerry, and he's going to obviously come back in a few weeks and completely say, no, 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 you're completely wrong here, Nils. But, but I think of Jerry having gone the other way. Actually, I think of him being in the Kaizen camp uh, early in his days, trying to you know, make a lot of improvements, but actually now coming to the to the conclusion that actually that the, what he's got right now, there's not very much that he feels he can improve other than keep adding markets and getting more diversification. But we'll let him speak for himself, of course. But when I think of John Henry, and again, I have no basis really for saying this, but if you agree with me, which I think you did, that John Henry as a firm – um, through these massive success that they had, let's not forget they became the biggest CTA in the yep. world. Um, started out in the camp of making no, uh, you know, sticking with what you have. Let's call it that. It doesn't mean that you don't fiddle with, but sticking more or less with what you have. When I think of, and this is pure speculation, when I think of what he's done in in the, in his next part of his career, moving into sports, you know, baseball uh, and European football. I imagine that those clubs actually does Kaizen because if you think about how you manage the team and how you constantly try and improve and 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 do this and do that in order to make that little bit extra um and of course it's probably not John Henry doing this but but I think of that as probably a more Kaizen model uh, in order to achieve the tremendous success that he's also achieved in the world of sports um and and that's a uh... You, you, now you're going to cause me to think, and and uh, isn't this the essence of of, of podcast? Uh, uh, sure. Is is that uh, are there some industries or markets where kaizen would be more applicable to, and others 
that they're not. So uh, is trading uh, in trend following, does that lend itself to Kaizen incremental improvement philosophy? And we'll sort of say as baseball or an industry or your sports where, you know, is that dynamic? Uh, it does, is there a certain dynamic? Is, is that it would mean that you need to have more incremental improvements given the nature of the industry. Now, uh, incremental improvement doesn't mean that you're constantly changing your philosophy. So, so in both cases, if you're a trend follower, you're going to say a, a, a Kaizen doesn't say, oh, I'm going to be a trend follower today and I'm going to be a non-trend follower tomorrow. What it says is that given my philosophy, how do I become a better trend follower? How do I incrementally sort of say, is there... And, it could be as simple as is that we talked about the nickel contract. We say like Kaizen would probably as an incremental improvement say like, well, should I think about LME in a different way? How do I change the sizing of my LME positions? Should I you know, drop LME from my portfolio? Is there something about the, how that those markets cha- trade relative to other markets that would suggest that I should do things slightly differently? So it doesn't mean changing for the sake of changing. It means how to improve given the dynamic nature of the environment you face. Yeah, which is part of, in a sense, being adaptable, which is also part of what trend followers are by nature. So, but I feel there's a blog post coming up from you on this point, Mark, where you have to really dig in (laughs) and uh, say, well, was he really right about this thing about football and uh, baseball versus trend following? And did did, uh, John Henry really move from a, you know, stick with what you know to a a more Kaizen oriented uh, model? It's fascinating. And of course, um, we get asked these questions a lot. Uh, Actually, it's a really relevant relevant point because we are always asked typically at the when we're in a drawdown um <clears throat> couldn't you make some changes to avoid this drawdown i, I remember specifically the uh, february of 2018 volmageddon um where uh, there was like a 12 day period that was very painful uh, for trend followers, um, you know, it came just after a very, very strong um, January. Um, but still, a lot of investors would come up and say, but isn't there something you can do to make these um, rapid drawdowns go away? And the answer is yes, absolutely. But the problem is the long-term performance drops if you start fiddling to um, avoid uh, short-term drawdowns. Similarly, with the November last year, if we came up with other types of models, maybe shorter-term models, whatever, that could have made that period a slightly less painful, we definitely wouldn't have made as much money as we've done in uh, in the next four months, for sure. So. It's all about a trade-off. It's all about being thoughtful about your research process. But I do think this is one thing that's really important for, for, for trend followers and, of course, for many other businesses, and that is constant improving the processes you apply, including the way you think about things and uh, having some good discussions um, amongst uh, the people working together about these things Um like we do on on the podcast, right? We we don't always have all the answers yet. We don't always know where the conversations are going to go. But if we can have some thoughtful conversations, then everyone can take something away from them uh, and hopefully apply it in their own process. And that's when when I always say in the beginning that we want people to, you know, we don't want to, you know, that they have to think like we do. We just want them to think. Um, that's that's the important part. And, and the important part you bring up, like uh, the uh, the big vol again, and when you have bad performance, it doesn't mean that you have to change, okay? But it does mean you say like it's almost like this event that I didn't expect prior to that uh, period is now embedded in my mind. It is it is now occurred. It's a reality. So how do I deal with this new reality? So uh, that vol you know explodes. Or similarly, is is that you look at March twenty twenty? Is is that we have this 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 kind of explosion and then Fed response? This is that this is not a thought experiment. It is reality. So now I have to say, how do I deal with that? And now one conclusion could be. Is, is that I don't have to deal with it because my model already sort of accounted for that. Is is that it just sort of said I have stop losses. You know, I don't have to do anything different because it it sort of says uh, you know I've already accounted for this 
So others could say, maybe I didn't account for it appropriately, and now I have to make some adjustments after I do more research. But when when events occur, you can't sort of, uh, it, it's almost like, <laughs> I'm sorry, half joke, this is that when you say something to your wife, and then after it comes out your mouth, you said, maybe I shouldn't have said that. This is that you can't take it back. So whatever happens in markets, you cannot take back. So now you have to incorporate. How do you deal with it after it's a, it's now occurred? And then say, uh, and then you can say, yes, I appropriately handled that situation, or you say, no, I now have to adjust my behavior given the new information I have. Yes. No. Absolutely. All right. Very good stuff. Um, let's. Um Speaking of the devil, let's look at the devil in the detail, meaning the performance numbers. Um, and these are numbers that we have not seen for a while in terms of monthly returns. But the uh, Beta 50 index is up 6.87% now in March so far with another four trading days to go. Uh, actually, with five trading days to go because this number does not include Friday, of course, uh, which I think was a positive day as well. Uh, up 9.88 for the year. Uh, the SockGen CTA index up 8.7% five for the month up 13.87 for the year uh, the stock gen trend index up 10.52 percent for the month up 18.6 for the year uh, short-term traders also doing well up four percent for the month up 5.8 percent for the year as mentioned before my trend barometer still super strong at 75 um Maybe to many people's surprise, uh, maybe even to my surprise, MSCI World Index having a good month, 2.39% up, but still down 5.65% for the year. Um, but not to many people's surprise, I think by now, the World Government Bond Index having another tough month, down 2.81% just in March alone. Um, so having a very rough year so far. Um, we're going to wrap up this conversation. We've already been going for 75 minutes. So we appreciate all of you who are still here. Um, if you enjoy these conversation, you want to share them with uh, some of your friends and colleagues, uh, why not use the link toptradersunplugcom forward slash share because then people can actually go and find the podcast player of their choice very easily, one click and put it on their phone and get all the new updates we have. We have some great conversations coming up in the allocator series and then we're going to go back to do something super interesting i'm so excited about it and that is we're going to reopen the global macro series as our wednesday uh, episode in a few weeks um and i am going to keep secret who my co-host going to be but you are going to love him because you loved him when he was on the podcast a few weeks ago um Next week, I'm joined by Rich. So that is always going to be super fun when uh, Professor Brennan comes and talks about his battleship and all all good things. Uh, so make sure your questions come in by email, info at toptradersandplug.com. And uh, Rich and I will do our best to get them out uh, to you on uh, next weekend. And also make sure you follow us on Twitter because sometimes we do actually share some great content, especially someone like Mark. Uh, maybe compared to me, I'm not that uh, active there um trend barometer you can find and the daily market score for those of you who are not familiar with those things it can be found on the website of course from mark and me thanks ever so much for listening and we look forward to being back with you next week until next time take care of yourself and take care of each other Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.